the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we come to the parish church and we celebrate, by all accounts, what is a feast of the Lord. It is the presentation of the Lord in the temple, and yet, one might notice, that we are in blue, which we wear on feasts of the Mother of God. It is also apparent when we read the Troparian that the Troparian is celebrating not only the Lord for his goodwill towards us and his condescension to our humanity, but also praising the Mother of God for her participation in this feast. So while this is indeed a feast of the Lord, we have to think about this. The Lord became who we are in our entirety. He subjected himself to our, uh, to our humanity. He became what we are entirely. He partook of hunger willingly, partook of thirst willingly, and he also partook of the weaknesses that come with childhood. So, you know, this is something I asked Father Gregory. Why do we wear uh, blue on the Feast of the Presentation when it's the Feast of the Lord? And, and Father Gregory said very simply, have you ever seen a 40-day-old baby walk miles to get to the temple for purification? I said, well, no, I have not seen that. And, of course, the Lord would not do such a thing because he desired to partake of our humanity in its entirety. He decided he desired to be what we are so we can become what he is. And so, with the participation of the Mother of God, with the participation of all of Israel, the Lord subjected himself to our humanity. And this feast really is a good icon of what it means to participate in our salvific work with the Lord. Because we see here other people who were present in the temple at the time of the Lord. Of course, you have the mother of God and Joseph, who came for the rite of purification, that 40-day blessing after having a child. Of course, the Lord did not need purification, nor did his mother, having given birth to him without corruption, without defilement, without having lost any blood, as, as is the, the nature of, of uh, childbearing in the fall. And yet... The Lord, desiring to fulfill all righteousness and to fully subject himself to the law and perfectly fulfill it, did this thing for our salvation, to reveal to us his own holiness and the perfection of his love. And so him and the mother of God came. And a miraculous thing happened. Zechariah, the priest, who was the, the father of St. John the Baptist, <coughs> took the mother of God and brought her into the place of the temple where the virgins stand. This was something that was very miraculous, something that caused quite the uh, consternation with the Pharisees. But for one, it was something that he had been waiting for for quite some time. You see, there was a man in the temple, just as we have a very small man in the temple right now, Simeon. Simeon was, as it says in the scriptures, a man of very old age who was full of the Holy Spirit and awaiting the coming of Christ. Now, the scriptures say he was of a very old age. So we might think, oh, perhaps that's someone in their 80s or their 90s or whatever. No. Simeon, as our tradition tells us, was one of the 72 elders who was taken to Alexandria uh, by uh, Ptolemy to translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, which is known as the Septuagint. Now, if any of you are history buffs, you might know and you might say, well, wait a second. The Septuagint came out two, three hundred years before Christ. It came out in the third century, and you are correct. Simeon was born and lived three centuries before Christ was born. And as he was translating the prophecy of Isaiah, he saw in Isaiah 7, uh, 14, this prophecy, And behold, uh, there shall come a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel. That is God with us. And he, in his unbelief, in his lack of faith, said, well, it is impossible for a virgin to conceive. So it, I, I think this really means a young woman, and I'll translate it as such. But as he was about to write this text in the Greek, his hand was stopped by the Archangel Gabriel. And the Archangel Gabriel said, no, you are, you are mistaken, and your lack of faith could condemn you. Truly, it means a virgin shall conceive and bear a child. And here's a marvelous sign. You shall not die until you see this miracle fulfilled. So Simeon was subjected to this life, this life of pain and suffering for 360 some odd years until the coming of Christ, waiting every day in the temple to see this thing fulfilled. This is something for us that might be difficult to understand. 
You know, those of us in our culture who are used to next day shipping, or Amazon Prime, or all of these things, where we get everything within a day. Everything we want comes within a day. And yet we see this miracle, this, this man, Simeon, who is an icon of all of Israel, who waited almost 300 years for the coming of the Messiah. He waited almost 300 years every day going into the temple, waiting to see this miracle, never ceasing to despair, never ceasing to lose his faith in Christ. See, he had two options. He could have gotten really bitter. He could have gotten really angry at the Lord for holding him in this life. You know, there, there are those today, we call them, you know, the transhumanists or whatever, who believe that they can overcome the, the suffering of this world, the sicknesses of this world, um, and, and find immortality, be free from death, right? And, and somehow they think it's a great idea to live forever in this fallen world of immense suffering, of immense toil, of immense pain. Ultimately what it does is increase their pain and suffering in this, in this age and brings the grave to them even closer than they desire. You know, we see in Simeon instead this, this desire to see the coming of the Lord and this ever-present faithfulness to the plan that the Lord had for him. Trusting God and persevering in that seeking for the promise. And finally, one day, he goes to the temple, like he did every other day, waiting for the sign to come. After 300 years of being kept alive by the Holy Spirit, and there he sees a woman going for purification, standing among the virgins, and with her a child. And he sees that salvation which he had translated, which he had written down into Greek. He saw the very thing that he had lost faith in those hundreds of years before. And he rushed to the child, and he held the child in his arms, holding God, the, 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 the one who fashioned creation with his hands. He held him in his arms and witnessed the salvation of Israel. And knowing this, we see how, how powerful this prayer is. He has held Christ in his arms. He has endured the suffering of this life, for hundreds of years, and he begs the Lord. He says, Now let us thou thy servant depart in peace, O Master, according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast uh, worked upon thy people, light of revelation for the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. So here he sees the salvation of the world, and he asks to be released from this life. And so too, we see the prophetess Anna. Anna was a prophetess in the temple. She had been, it says that she had been, it, um, a, she had been a prophet in the temple, praying and fasting after her um, widow. She had been widowed by her husband after only seven years of marriage. She had been married for seven years um, at a very, a very young age, because they got married much younger than we do now. And then she was widowed. And as such, she waited in the temple for likely around 70 years. Um, you know, it's four score and, and four years ago. I'm not, I don't know what a score is. I know, I, I know I've learned it at some point, but it's, it's defeated me. But she was 83 years old, uh, point is, at the time of the coming of Christ. She too, she too had a choice. You know, the Jews very much saw childbirth as a sign of blessing, right? Childbirth as a sign of blessing, which is why Saints Joachim and Anna were in great pain over not having a child for so long. They were grieved by this, and they struggled in prayer and fasting in order to have children because the Jews believe with each child born we were getting closer to the Messiah, which is true. Every child that was born would bring them closer to the Messiah, so long as those children partook of the life of God. And so she, being devoid of her husband, having had no children, could have easily fallen into despair, could have easily blamed God for this quote-unquote misfortune that had come upon her. But instead, what did she do? She dedicated her life to virginity. She dedicated her life to prayer and fasting, to asceticism, and to awaiting the coming of the Messiah. She spent every day in the temple. She struggled and fasted. She is a model for us, for those of us who perhaps have lost our spouses, or for those of us who don't have a spouse. This is the way in which we are to live, praying and fasting, awaiting for the good things to come. But they also are a model for us in our own lives. Because very often, um, I, I don't mean to project on any of you, but there are things in which we desire. There are things in which we wish to see happen. There are, there are painful situations we see going on in our world, whether it be the war in Ukraine, whether it be issues with our family, whether it be somebody we know who has fallen away from the faith, or some sort of sin we are struggling with. All of these things are things the Lord has given us to teach us patience, to teach us humility, to teach us perseverance. 
We are not going to have these things solved tomorrow. You know, this is not Amazon Prime. We can't type in the order and say, I order all of my problems to go away, and then just wait for a day, and it goes. No, th this is not how it works. This is not a passive thing. This is not something that the Lord's just going to take away from us. We have to wait and live out in faith as Simeon and Anna did. We read in St. Paul's epistle, the Hebrews of faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. We do not see the result of what it is we're praying for. We do not know how it is the Lord is going to work these things. Simeon did not know what the Savior would look like or who would come from him, and yet every single day he lived in faith. He lived in expectation of that mystery being fulfilled. So too, the prophet is Anna. She did not know what the Christ would look like, when he would come, all of these things, and yet she continued to abide in the hope that he would. So too with us, in our very struggles in life, we must abide in the hope that God's will is above our will, and that in time he will resolve these issues. And if only we will persevere in prayer, if only we will not give up praying for those things we know are good, whether it be for our loved ones to come to the faith, whether it be for these uh, difficulties in our world to be resolved, we should not lose hope. We should not lose hope. We should instead trust in the Lord and trust in his good will, that he desires not the death of a sinner, rarely be converted from his wickedness and live, and recognize that perhaps we will be praying for these things every single day for our entire lives. Perhaps we may not even see the fruit of these things coming. Many of the Jews, I mean, Christ came, you know, 2,000 years ago. But there's a couple thousand more years of Jewish history where the people awaited the coming of the Messiah and never saw him. And yet they never ceased to remain faithful. We, we read many times in the Old Testament of those who, who broke their faith, of who fell away, who did all these horrible things. But there were others, like Enosh, like Noah, like Abraham. All of these people who never saw the coming of the Lord, but who lived according to faith. Who lived in the expectation of the promise. And yet, not even in their lifetimes they saw it. So to us, with our struggles, we should pray that the Lord may handle them, that the Lord may bring a resolution to them, and know that we may not see them in this lifetime. And that's okay. God's plan is far above our plan. God's will is above ours. His ways are above our ways. And he will handle things far better than we think they can be handled. So let us, brothers and sisters, look to the example of Simeon, the example of Anna, and the example of all of Israel waiting the expectation of the Lord and their patient endurance, and ask the Lord to help us, that we may patiently await the coming of the Lord, that we may patiently await his salvation, which has been wrought for us and for all people, and we may be enlightened by this revelation and come to him in faith. May the Lord grant this to all of us. Amen.